Every day they used to business sitting there for magic potions destroying me friends stealing his phone. And uh, I'm joined by Sean McGee and Kevin Hester. Kevin has do, has come back again this week to give us another update on the in- extinction report. And uh, today we're going to be hearing some strange uh, news concerning um, possible deaths slash murders uh, in connection with scientists who have been investigating the uh, Arctic Sea ice melt. Um, so. Good afternoon, Kevin, and thanks again for joining us here on European News Weekly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Nice to be back. Yes, it's pretty shocking news coming out from Professor uh, Peter Wadhams from Cambridge University. We spoke last week about Wadhams, and he was talking about the potential for a catastrophic release of methane from the uh, from the Arctic, and that that's been. Uh, well documented by Natalia Shakova and Igor Similov, the Russian uh, experts who were studying up there. Well, Wadhams came out this week and he said that he, the three scientists who were investigating the melting ice may have been uh, assassinated. Let me see. Now, the, the three scientists he identified were Seymour Laxton and Catherine Giles, who are both climate scientists at the University College of London and Tim Boyd of the Scottish Association for Marine Science. They all died within the space of a few months in, in early 2003. Now, this is a pretty contentious thing for Wadhams to say, that these people may have been uh, victims of, of some kind of conspiracy. And it's obviously, you know, you never can say for sure what happened. But those of us who have been following... Uh, the, the nuclear uh, scene for many years will remember that back in 1974 there was a woman called Karen Silkwood and Karen Karen blew the whistle on a whole lot of radiation um, that was that was leaking from a, a, a nuclear plant and some laboratories where she had been studying and she was taking it to the press and going public and she died under extremely suspicious circumstances where she had a car accident. And they found that the car had been it was it was never it was never proven that that she'd been murdered, but the car had been rear-ended and it had a lot of damage bef- before it left the road. And a lot of us in the in the anti-nuclear community believed that she had been murdered. Now this sounds like you know a conspiracy theory. It's people might say, oh, you know, you, you you're joining dots that shouldn't be joined. But it's important to remember that there's. When the push has come to shove, corporates have never held back from ever doing doing something like that. And the last example I would like to give is Ken Sarawira. And I don't know if people know about Ken, but Ken was an activist in Nigeria. And, and he, he busted out a whole lot of um, scandal about Shell Petroleum and, and both the incredible leaking of oil in the, in the marshlands in Nigeria and also the backhanders that Shell had been paying to Niger- corrupt Nigerian officials. And in the end, Ken was hung. He was in prison and then he was hung by the puppet regime that was being controlled to a large extent by those oil companies. And a long time afterwards, Shell, Shell agreed to pay $15.5 million, nearly £10 million, in settlement of a legal action when it was accused of having collaborated in the execution of Ken Sarawera and eight other leaders of the Ogoni tribe in southern Nigeria. I'm not saying that those scientists were killed, but I'm saying that anyone who speaks out about the climate catastrophe that is happening happening is putting themselves in danger because there's very, very big money at stake. Well, Kevin, so do you think Peter is in, uh, his life is in danger now or... Are, are we? Is is there a kind of like a sense in the community out there at large that the, uh, the, the a major event is just upon us, and that he, you know, what sort of time frames are we looking at for these uh, uh, for, for these uh, deaths or these murders that have been alleged? 
um, they happened in 2013. And one of the people was killed in a, in a car accident with a truck. She was on a bicycle and was run down. But Wadhams had, before that had happened, Wadhams had laid a complaint with the, with the police where he had, had a, a, near, a near death experience with a truck. And he, you know, where the and he was um, walking. I think he was. I don't think he was on a bike. But he nearly got knocked down by a truck. And he believed it was uh, an attempt that hit and run on him. So you know, I, I think what will happen is, is that as we get closer and closer to collapse, there'll be more and more motivation for the powers that be to try and silence people. So there's always the risk that activists have. And I think this is a way to keep scientists quiet and keep them worried. You know, there was a lot of a lot of talk years ago when uh, Michael Mann came out with the hockey stick uh, analogy, and he came under incredible pressure and attack from the fossil fuel industry. And I think it's a way for them to intimidate scientists who aren't who aren't fundamentally activists like us. They're scientists, and they're reporting on what they see. And terrorising people is a really good way to keep them quiet. Mm -hmm. Well, they've tried various uh, methods. You know, I don't know. You know, as you say, it's in it's uh, up in the air whether they were murdered or not. Amazing that Wadham stepped forward on this, though. I've got to say, you know, you mentioned Shell there as a, uh, you know, uh, with the guy in Africa. You know, you basically we we actually interviewed uh, Charles Williams Diggs on this show and uh, very recently, and he was telling us that activists were being run off the road, uh, doctors were being forced out of Florida, uh, vets were being, uh, you know, sort of threatened if they did uh, um, uh, any sort of testing on animals that they were getting, and trying to connect it with the uh, correct or the oil spill that happened uh, in uh, there in 2010 so at the end of the day it's it's it, the connections you know for uh, for the manipulation of scientists is certainly there um, we, we, we were obviously have to wait for the further evidence to come and, up and might I just add on to that equation because yeah. Kevin I'm not sure if Kevin is aware that uh, recently there was a, a court case in Castlebar and it surrounded a shell and the, the shell to sea project in uh, the, the curb shell to sea and uh, there was allegations uh, and there was uh, statements made to the court about Gardi and alcohol and that they were getting alcohol uh, and and one of the uh, one of the men said in open court that his business was ruined and uh, one of the worst events in his life was was back at when he went to a particular protest and the guards were w one particular sergeant I believe it was he was making say, I'm going to run those feckers into the sea i.e. the protesters I'm going to run them into the sea is what this guard was, was, has been uh, has been said he, he said basically it's that's crazy you know this is what's happening uh, Jimmy <laughs> I can I can add add to that just a little bit more yeah because this week shell have been given the go ahead to actually uh go for oil in the arctic they've been given that go ahead now it was just the last few days right so so you, it's interesting timing if you spoke to people in central america and in south america and in, in the rainforest areas in south america that are being denuded and if you spoke to people in nigeria about this they would they would say what are this, this is the big deal about you guys talking about these three or four scientists? All our activists have been murdered for decades. And it's, there's a history of activists being, being murdered in those kind of totalitarian states. Well, our, our own states are becoming more and more totalitarian every day. To think that it's not going to happen in places like the, in Britain, Ireland, New Zealand, Australia would be naive. No, you're quite correct. I think I came across an, an article there. Sean, do you have a speaker on? Um, I think I came across an article there last week, I believe it was, and, um, and it, it, it was uh, in relation to, to activists and stuff and how they've been targeted and murdered. And I think it was through the Guardian. I, I, it's very, very short notes. I'm not sure if I'll be able to find that. But, uh, yeah, there are reports of that coming out, about how, how, how activists are being targeted and murdered uh, in huge numbers, huge numbers. And of course, yeah, we have to remember that this uh, this isn't just aimed at scientists. This kind of threat, whether it's murdering or whether it's uh, phone hacking or all the things that we've been reporting in the recent weeks, um, it's you know sort of basically they're they're turning around and uh, they're trying to sort of uh, uh, do an overall thing. And it also affects journalists. 
journalists also uh, want to back off. It also affects activists who get get a little bit worried. Um, but you know, the thing is that they've been doing this for some time, and uh, you know, the, the people that know what's what's true are are uh, strong enough to carry on. You know, so this is this is a good thing. You know. That's, I wanted to make the point that for people who are listening to this in developed Western countries in the Northern Hemisphere, they might find it extraordinary that we would be talking that these kind of assassinations could have taken place. But the people in Africa and the people in Central and South America, they wouldn't find this, this conversation extraordinary at all. They'd say this has been going on for decades. It's just come to your place now. It sounds like we need to reach out to people who activists in South America then, Sean, and, and, and get their testimonies. What do you reckon? Well, there is some of that as well. I mean, uh, and we've got uh, we have a famous nuclear um, sort of activist who was murdered in the UK as well, reportedly. You know, so it's um, you know we don't have to go too far afield to to, to find out of these kind of situations. Um, well, a classic case of it happening to my, in my, uh, what I believe was the case of David Kelly, who was the whistleblower on the sexing up. That's his. They were his words where where the, they sexed up all the papers and all the information about the chemical weapons in Iraq, and and the Blair government justified invading Iraq and killing a million people, a million people, and. And David Kelly came out and he testified and, and went public that it was all a, a, a beat up. And then he died under spectacularly uh, suspicious circumstances on the moors where he had supposedly committed suicide and, and cut his wrists. But one of the, the, the first um, doctors that uh, attended to his body at the scene said that he'd seen more people who had, with blood noses who had bled more than, than David Kelly. Wow. Uh, something else, you know, we've de definitely got, I mean, we'll, we'll be doing a small report about um, uh, people on Facebook and, uh, you know, generally on the internet uh, being hacked, you know, activists. Uh, this week, there's been some sort of uh, uptick in in trying to block uh, links being shared and what have you, but we'll, we'll, we'll be doing that report as uh, part of our first hour, you know, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's an ongoing thing and it has many uh, different ways of, uh, of, of rearing its head. Uh, the manipulation of people so it wasn't my normal extinction report but it concerns death and i thought it was an important thing for us to discuss no it is important. Yeah, well we've then, had yeah. we've had reports about the arctic about black ice as well uh, kevin and um i don't know if you picked up on it uh, and what it is basically it's do you think that's because of the result of the wildfires in canada and alaska dumping mm. soot onto the uh, uh, the ice Yes, absolutely it is. Jason Box, uh, from his project, the Dark Snow Project, he's just released a, a paper yesterday where uh, they are talking exactly about that and saying that <clears throat> a lot of that um, soot is now landing on the, on the ice and lowering the albedo. It's just what we talk about. Every week it's getting worse, more. Um, well, last, last week we reported that the plume, uh, some of it headed southeast on the jet stream, and uh, some more headed uh, sort of uh, east, you know, and probably north as well towards the Arctic. So that's one thing. Uh, did, Kevin, did you also pick up on uh, uh, Paul Beckworth? Uh, Beckwith, isn't it? I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Beckwith. Yes. Yeah. Did you pick up on his latest video? I think he was talking about. Uh, uh, well, he's talking about a range of subjects actually, but it's a it's an update and it's on his YouTube channel. Yeah, I'd advise anyone to look up Paul on, on YouTube, and, and he has a very public Facebook presence as well, and he's very prolific. So Paul Beckwith, B-E-C-K-W-I-T-H, great man. Excellent, and uh, we certainly check that out because he's put up about eight videos, and he's he's discussing various aspects of uh, of the uh, the Arctic ice and various other things, uh, which are to do with global warming and uh, things happening much quicker than. Uh, and we've had a few reports of that this week. Things are happening much quicker. You know, sea levels are rising quicker um, than they uh, they supposed. Uh, there's issues with the jet stream. It may be speeding up. Um, and then that that was uh, there's a report actually if they give me a moment um, I will get to that is a report um, from meteorolog meteorologist uh, Leon Brown of the Weather Channel UK said the super strength El Nino um, could uh, 
be created and could even dislodge the de jet stream, leading to more unstable weather in the UK this autumn. And that will obviously have an effect on Europe and Norway as well. Well, in relation uh, to that, Sean, though, we're also hearing about this above average 3C uh, increase in the Pacific temperatures uh, and they're, they're calling the, this current El Nino the Godzilla El Nino. Yeah, which yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just read a little bit more from, uh, there's an actual article up on the Express about it with mm. the title, Shock Warning, Strongest El Nino in History Could Bring Six Months of Storms to Britain. Um, and of course, El Nino is the Pacific being hot and then that El Nino effect happening. But further down, I mean, I'll read the rest of the article. It's just a, a little bit that uh, uh, was quoted from Mr. Leon, uh, the meteorologist Leon Brown. Um, and it goes on to say the biggest impact El Nino is, is around the tropics, as we have started to see with a greater number of tropical storms. However, it is a very powerful phenomenon and has knock-on effects across the globe in America, Asia, Australia and Europe. There are signs that this year, is, uh, this year a significant El Nino is building. We think it could drive a strong jet stream which could lead to more mobile weather pattern and very changeable and stormy weather as we head into winter. So this is just a kind of a warning that's going out. Now the Express isn't necessarily uh, top notch but we're, we're aware of all these stories going on and uh, Leon Brown obviously feels it's important to say this and he's putting his credibility behind it as well. Um, it, you know, we, we had a bad winter there a little while back, uh, a few, you know, in 2013 um, and now in 2015 it looks like we're heavy, heading towards a very similar uh, sort of winter with uh, flooding, constant rain um, and all this kind of thing. So um, I thought an yeah, interesting it, point that was brought up in that article though, Sean, because this is something like we normally get our storm systems coming across the Atlantic, right? Most of them. Yeah. Now what he's talking about is these Pacific, the Pacific cyclones actually just possibly steering off course and coming north and over towards mm -hmm. England, Ireland, Norway. You know, we're not used to seeing cyclones from the Pacific come our way, you know. I think that's, yeah, a, well, that's a pretty mad well, development. That, that, that's, that's what happens that's when our jets are really Look, um, t talking about the, the El Nino and the out-of-season cyclones, one of my Facebook friends, DJ Rebel, has just posted on my wall that there is a cyclone developing off the coast of Australia as we speak, and it's in the middle of July. It's the end of July, for goodness sake. This is the heart of the winter, and we're getting a, 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 what's effectively a tropical cyclone building off the coast of Australia. Uh, the link comes from John's Weather Channel, and I'll, I'll quote a little bit what they say. What, well, well, what do we have here? As Ken suggested earlier, a possible cyclone may develop near the Solomon Islands, and some models suggest in a week's time. A few weeks ago, we had our first ever July cyclone in this region to be recorded. And now, <clears throat> and we could move into the first week of August with the same thing happening. It's just unbelievable. This is completely unheard of for us to be having this kind of uh, weather, act, weather systems forming at this time of the year. There is no normal well, I, anymore. I have to say, uh, you know, Paul Beckwith did measure, mention something about uh, hotter water um, and uh, uh, or, or some effect that hot water has in the Antarctic, and they've, they've been noticing uh, various changes in that. So I don't know if those two are con connected. You know, I suppose they are. Well, it, the, because of, in the northern hemisphere we have the meandering jet stream, where where the jet stream has been changed, and that we've got the the Gulf Stream, the, which is the ocean currents, stalling. And that is why the weather is so distorted up there, where you're getting the weather patterns from the Arctic coming down onto the continental United States. <clears throat> and everyone's saying, oh, what happened to the, the global warming when we're having these incredible weather patterns? But it's all about climate change and climate disruption. And it, as, as we speak each week now, something radically new and different is happening. Yeah, uh, true. You know, since our last discussion last week, there have been, in that one week, there have been 600 fires burning in Canada, in West Canada, 600. It's two and a half times the um, average over the last 20 years happening at the moment. You know, it's not a 10% increase or a 20%, it's a 250% increase. And I believe there's also reports coming out too of uh, fires uh, running amok in California. Yeah, it's everywhere. I, I, I would be dreading, if I lived in Australia, I would be dreading this coming summer with the El Nino kicking in. And they're talking about, as you, as you said, a monster El Nino. 
there's going to be winds and, and dry, dry winds going across Australia. I think we'll see a, a, a summer fire season in Australia that's never been seen before. Wow. You know, and, and I mean, Australia, you're, you're not strangers to fires in Australia, of course, you know, uh, because like, well, my understanding is basically like that the, the fires are a natural process as well. Like, but I think what we're seeing here is a little bit unprecedented because like Canada, Alaska are also not no strangers to fires. But I, I think it's just the sheer scale of the uh, above normal averages that we're seeing. Like, you know, uh, I think you mentioned six, uh, for Canada, six uh, six times to 25 year average you know that's 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 a huge increase you know oh, it's 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 on steroids the whole the whole weather system is on steroids right well uh, on a positive note which i think i need to bring in um, <laughs> oh, i was the optimist sean oh, i was the optimist. oh absolutely absolutely <laughs> uh there is uh, a professor called uh, uh mark jacobson um and he's done a a, a, a tedx talk uh, at uh, palo alto high school um, and so uh, Dr. Mark Z. Jacobson, and he teaches at Stanford University. Um, so basically he's doing the talk and he has, he said, he has the plan for every single solitary state to transition to safe, clean, green, sustainable energy and halt climate chaos. And he's had this plan for three years. So when we're looking at solutions, we know they're out there. Um, and we need to get them out. And I would ask everybody to uh, go onto YouTube and type in Mark J Jacobson, powering the world with wind and water and sunlight. So uh, at the end of the day, that's, uh, that's a YouTube thing to go and check out. Um, and we have solutions to all this continuing madness. We, we just have to uh, find a way of uh, de uh, de disengaging from a very uh, sort of dodgy, uh, sort of uh, system that's just not uh, sustainable in any way. Um, so I might, might also point out uh, on that front we have good news because Portugal has arrested a banker in connection with the 2008 uh, crash and you know the fraud that's going on. So we have Iceland and Portugal now have uh, are arresting bankers for their criminality. So and well done, Portugal. Another little interesting bit of, on the positive note. I know this this is going to shoot our doom show out of the water. Like, but we're hearing reports too that France is making a commitment to reduce its nuclear use by 50 percent uh, by 2022. So I think that's a that's a good good idea. Idea. Um. Right. So, uh, is Kevin uh, with us still? I am indeed. Excellent. All uh, right, mate. Uh, well, I was thinking we could be winding this up now. I suppose is there is there anything anybody's got uh, to add? I mean, there's certainly a fair few stories around. Uh, we I think we've hit some of the the more interesting ones. Uh, anything uh, that you would like to add? Um, well, oh, sorry, Kevin. I, I do. I do hear you when you say that there are those positive things that France is talking about reducing its nuclear and, and there are, people are talking about more, more wind and water. But the reality is, is that we have pushed the, the, the biosphere over the cliff and none of this piecemeal approaches would have any, any real genuine effect. To do anything about slowing down or attempting to stop the catastrophe that we're faced with requires a radical approach. We will see them go to, to Paris in November and they will play tiddlywinks. They will make, they will make um, promises of concessions by 2020 and 2050. Unless they, unless they step up to the plate and do something radical, absolutely radical, there is absolutely no chance. I don't believe there's any chance of turning this around anyway. But all of this talk of this, this small little actions and small little endeavours from people is just to distract people into thinking that something's being done about it. Nothing's being done about it. It's business as usual. As you said, Shell is on the way to the Arctic to drill for oil as we speak. Yeah, but they've yet to get there, and uh, and I'm sure I'm sure we're going to have a lot of uh, pressure on them to stop. But you know, I mean, there's so many good activists doing things. I'd look at Erin Brockovich, for instance, and she's been putting out a lot of stuff about contamination, and she's been a great uh, you know uh, sort of uh, researcher for some time for activists. And she's put out a story uh, recently, you know, about uh, Louisiana. And I've uh, got a little update for us about Louisiana. You know, once again, the information gets out and we can do something with it. This is my positive spin. And so uh, we're seeing, well, I'm hearing reports now that the birds that have left the reserve in Louisiana 
have done so because it's be, uh, there's been dumping of corexit waste in that site and the, it's, it's just made the birds go away or disappear uh, or maybe they're all dead I have no idea but in either event there's no no none of these birds that have been there for generations and generations uh, they've basically uh, just disappeared all of a sudden and we do have a, a report and I will we will be coming back to that story. but also in Louisiana we find out uh, that Erin uh, Brockovich has put out a story and she's on about uh, that the St. Bernard Parish water system is a chlorinated system and, and there's a problem with it. Uh, the use of chlorine is sequestered by adding ammonia. This is done by chlorine does not react with the dirt in the water which forms re regulated disinfectant byproducts. It makes chlorine weak and less reactive with bacteria as it breaks down, uh, uh, causes distribution system nitrification which supports biofilm growth. Um, well, I'd say go to Erin Brockovich on Facebook for the full post here on this one. <coughs> Excuse me. Louisiana health <laughs> officials confirmed Wednesday the presence of neg Negleria fla uh, fowlery amoeba in the St. Bernard Parish water system at the site of the sampling station. The water system, which serves 44,000 residents in St. Bernard Parish, was tested by the Louisiana Department of Health as part of the state's new public drinking water surveillance program, you know, four years after the BP Gulf oil spill. DHHS notified the water system and local officials on Wednesday evening this week. So uh, another story there, but another activist getting the information out there. And um, I might also point out for uh, the Irish out there that uh, Aaron Brockovich was one of the uh, activists who stepped forward uh, to provide uh, uh, le legal support for the six children uh, that were, or six young people that were uh, murdered. Well, they, they, they died uh, when they came off that, um, uh, was it the, um, oh, what's the name of it, Jimmy, the... Um, uh, the, the the vaccine is it? Um, no, no. There were six kids that got got died in that tragic accident in in California. Oh, the, uh, the, oh, right. Yeah, where the balcony collapsed. That's it. The right. Balcony yeah. Collapsed. Sorry, yeah, that's yeah. I, I just had a mind uh, about the word. So okay, so it's basically that they did that, and then Erin Brockovich stepped forward, and and she she's contacted uh, the families and also uh, people who were injured, young people that were injured, um, uh, that basically they might uh, be able to. Uh, access uh, health uh, issues or, or legal support uh, for claims and things like this. So Erin uh, Brockovich, you know, she really does do a lot of work and there are many, she's representative of many other uh, sort of uh, activists around the world uh, and I'm sure she has her problems as well but uh, we uh, we do see that, that uh, information is, is important and, uh, you know, I think uh, your job doing that uh, is very important. Uh, Kevin and, and yourself Jimmy as well well I think what we're also seeing like just to bring it back to the doomy sort of things where yet again we're seeing more problems with the biosphere and uh, and the water and we're seeing uh, amoeba brain eating amoeba in the groundwater you know it's it's quite shocking really it's just it's never ending so uh, what more can I say <laughs> I, well, I think what we're, we're gonna see going forward now is a lot of fiddling while Rome burns and a lot of people now recognize that we're in big trouble and they're trying to either assuage their guilt or make it look like they're doing something. I'll give you one example. Leonardo DiCaprio has just donated $40 million via his the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation um, to protect endangered species and help pre pre preserve the environment. So he's getting all this kudos about parting with this $40 million, which is probably the fees from one movie that he might make. But I hate to burst the bubble off, the Leonardo DiCaprio bubble, about this recent philanthropic behaviour. It's driven by a desire not to end up on the pointy end of a pitchfork at the end of the day. <laughs> well, this is the DiCaprio extinction and, report, Kevin. <laughs> DiCaprio and his cohorts will be flying <clears throat> down to his luxury, luxury resort in Belize in their private Learjets, where one home alone was recently bought by Colony uh, Capital CEO Tom Barrack for $11 million. Okay. These people are bugging out as our biosphere is unravelling. And at the same time, they're putting their hand up and saying, oh, look at me, the, the great environmentalist. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty cynical about it. I'm sorry. 
I, I We're see, seeing a lot of rich Americans sure. heading towards the west co western coast of Europe at the moment. So uh, we've got Donald Trump in the west coast of Scotland with a golf course, and Donald Trump in the west coast of Ireland with a golf course. Hmm. Well, I'd be, I think, I'd be in the cynical department with Kevin. You know, <laughs> with, on that matter, we are brothers. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I've, I have a much more positive attitude on these things. We are kicking butt, um, and. Uh, <laughs> That's my view. Well, I reckon the planet's kicking butt, and it's probably uh, it's probably uh, with good reason. You know, we've we, we've destroyed the place, so she has a right to to fight back. Okay. Well, we've got um, got another interview. We've got to get through uh, shortly. Indeed. So, uh, 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 have you got anything to add there at all, uh, uh, Jimmy? Uh, Jimmy? No. Well, I just like to no, thank well, like to... Echo, Sean. Echo, Sean. Good God. You can't take him anywhere. <laughs> so, Kevin, I'd like to thank you uh, for coming on again for yet another Extinction Report, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you again next week. I know it's, it's late where you come from, so uh, look, thanks very, very much for, for taking the time out, and I uh, hope you have a good night's sleep now. It's been an absolute pleasure as always, and I can promise you when I come back next week, the great unravelling will have, will have travelled a very long way in seven days. Sean, anything you'd like Sean. to finish on? Uh, well, yeah, that was uh, perfect. I don't know why this echoing's going on. I'm not actually doing anything to uh, deserve it in theory. <laughs> <laughs> but we can cover we can cover messing about stuff and tinfoil hat stuff in uh, uh, very shortly. Anyway, take care, Kevin. <laughs> okay, go well. Farewell. Uh, thanks very, very much, Kevin. Uh, that was Kevin Hester, and uh, that was the Extinction Report, which is exclusive to European News Weekly. And uh, Mr. Sean Mac Positivity, how are you doing, buddy? Are you trying to wreck our doom report? <laughs> Look, mate, I noticed I got bumped off the bleeding uh, audio as soon, as soon as I started saying something positive. You know? <laughs> this, is, this is getting more like godlike productions every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, uh, Sean. Look, we don't have a hell of a lot of time, so our our our, our next John Doe is up next, really, and uh, I think we should just tear on with that while we've got time because we're expecting Liam in uh, at six p.m. So um, yeah. sh shall we tear on with the John Doe interview? Do you want to introduce it? Oh well, uh, well, I just uh, I think we did the introduction on okay, it, but uh, okay. I just like to sort of bring you to someone who's uh, going to be. Uh, coming back to us uh, with future reports uh, from Japan and Japan life in Japan. Um, I think we're going to be doing this mainly to uh, let people know that there are many thousands, tens of thousands of people who are still affected by the nuclear disaster um, and they're not getting the help they need. Uh, there's health problems from the nuclear disaster uh, and there's big issues around uh, the big corporations making moves to uh, make Japan into a very right-wing unpleasant place uh, and uh, we will be reporting as we always have on these activists that are trying to fight this uh, this repression and trying to get the truth out. So uh, onwards with the uh, podcast, I think, Jimmy. Hi there. Today uh, we've got an interview with uh, the named John Doe. He uh, does that to protect his name because uh, he's actually based in uh, Tokyo, Japan, and he's an anti-nuclear activist. Uh, he's uh, an American Marxist. He's a... Uh, uh, journalist, he's, he's a lot of things. Uh, he can be found on Freedom WB on YouTube and um, basically you just look for uh, John Doe and uh, he will he, he has a lot of commentary that he puts up, uh, demonstrations and the like. Um, so basically without further ado I'd like to introduce uh, John Doe to the show. Hi John, how's it going in Tokyo today? Oh, you know, uh, Tokyo as always. It's a, a good, hot, steamy summer night at the time of this recording. You know, uh, we're enjoying summer here. And we're having it's a festival season right now, so we're having all that. You know, fireworks and drinking and all merry making. You know. Excellent, excellent. And um, I suppose I've got to sort of ask some questions. And um, you know, I've sort of described who you are. You, you're a, like like uh, ourselves. You're a blogger. You're a journalist. You're a researcher. Um, and you have some uh, consideration for the situation in uh, in Japan. Um, and we kind of met up uh, because of the Fukushima disaster and uh, trying to get uh, the information out where there was a lot of secrecy. Um, so I, I suppose I should say, you know, after all these years, uh, you've, you know, over four years now, um, how how has it been for you? I mean, I'm just going to bring it down to that. And how has it been for you? And um, 
uh, you know, in, on a personal note, as I said, your name's John Doe because you need to protect yourself. Uh, could you fill us in a little bit about uh, that situation and, you know, uh, how you've got on over the years? You mean from a personal perspective? Yeah, from personal perspective. Uh, yeah, that'd be well, well, you know, when it first happened, it was a very, um, to be honest, a very scary event. You know, I lived in Japan several years before it, before the whole earthquake in Fukushima happened, so I was kind of accustomed to minor earthquakes and things like that, you know. But to be honest, I would tell you the actual story, like where I was and what was happening the day it happened. I was, at the time, I was doing some English conversation type of stuff, right? It's where you, you show up to work and some people show up and you practice English with them. I do a different job now, but at that time I was doing So I had these three kind of like what you call in Japan, um... Uh, housewives, you know, and we're doing the lesson, it's going through fine, then we got a small shake, no big deal, we're used to that, you know, then it started to get really intense, it was really hard shaking, and when the building started rattling, and when, then we knew that this is serious, so we all kind of like um, ducked on our tables, and the shaking got really intense, and the building was like weaving, bob weaving back and forth, and there was a moment, you know, where I just said to myself, this is the end, you know, I'm going to die, you know. And I put my head between my legs, and I was ready for that. And after about two or three minutes, the shaking stopped. And I thought to myself, God, I'm alive. I'm alive. I've survived this, you know. So we didn't really know what's going on. So the whole office, the whole school there is a wreck. Everything's falling on the floor, and the desks are over, the lockers are over. So we all get out. I say, this guys, let's get out of the building. So we get out of the building, you know, and we go on the street, and everybody's on the street. Like, everybody. And it's total chaos. And, like, um... The local retail places are holding, showing up the video on their TV screens, and we're seeing what's going on. And we see this massive earthquake done hit Japan, and all these tsunamis are coming. You know, and everybody's like, what the hell just happened to us? You know, what are we going through? And we look at the train station, and there's a big old crack in the middle of the train station. And the trains have stopped, and everybody's on the street just bewildered by this, you know. Because in Japan, like I said, we're used to earthquakes. You know, earthquakes are something that we don't take all that serious. But this was something that was different. And I remember that, you know, we sent all the students home, you know. It was just me and the staff there, you know. And, and we watching all the ma the chaos going on on the TV. We looked up the Internet, you know, seeing all the tsunami damage and all the crazy stuff was going on, the nuclear meltdowns. And we're, all, we're in Tokyo just thinking, you know, what is happening to our nation? This country that, you know, that is not my own, but I fell in love with and I call my home and... You know, the Japanese staff, you know, it's their home. They've been born here, you know, they're all just freaking out. And eventually, you know, to be honest, you know, <laughs> we gave up. And I went down to the local liquor store and got a fifth of Jinro. Jinro is Korean liquor, by the way. I got a fifth of that hmm. and I picked up a bento, which we call a lunchbox. I picked up a couple of those and I fed the staff. We, we, you know, we cracked up that Jinro and had a couple of drinks. Watch all this going on and... There was another branch of the company I was working at, another school, it's very close by. And said, hey guys, if you can make it over to us, we're all going to camp out here for the night. It was about 10 people over there already, a couple of students and the rest of the staff. So you guys make it over, you know, come on over. So, we, you know, we had our lunch, watched the rest of the chaos, and the trains were shut down, right? So you could get on the train tracks and walk. So it was like three stations away from where we were at. So we just got that fifth of general, got on the train tracks and started walking, right? So we walked all the way on those train tracks. It was an unheard of thing in Japan, walking train tracks, right? Now, I'm from West Virginia. Walking train tracks is a normal thing. But in Tokyo, that is, you know, that's just happened. But this is a unique situation. So we walk those train tracks, and we get, on, get all the way over here to the next, uh, these three stations away, you know. And we get there, you know, it's, we find out it's, it's just a bunch of women, you know. There's, you know, and we two, we two guys show up, and they're like, oh, thank God, you know. I don't know why, you know, because I'm not a misogynist type of person. I'm not like a woman hating person, but Japan's where it is, you know. So why I had to do that night was basically secure the building and make sure the keys were okay and lock everything up and take care of them. And that was my that was my that was my first day with with the uh, earthquake and tsunami was trying to take care of people. And the next morning we woke up and the company said, "Nah, everybody go home." So the next morning, the trains were actually running in Tokyo. Believe it or not, then by like 9 o'clock, the trains were running. It was chaos. You know, I got on the train there, you know, and it took me like three hours to get home from like a normal 45-minute train ride. And eventually got home there, you know, and my internet was working, but we still we didn't have phone service for four days in Tokyo. 
But internet was fine. You could use internet, but you couldn't use your phone. You couldn't call anybody because it was so overwhelmed. And I just went home, got my got my PC there, you know, and just watched everything. And just every like five or six minutes, we get this hard earthquake. Like, every five or six minutes, man, it was like boom, 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 boom. You get shook the shit out of you, you know. And that went on for like two weeks. Two weeks of that. You imagine that, man. Two weeks. Every five or six minutes, you're getting this hard earthquake. You're getting like 6.5s, you know, 7s, every five or six minutes. That's the way it was for like two weeks in this country, you know. So that must so that's have been my very... personal experience of how, how initially it all went down, you know. And so that, maybe did that cause a lot of fear in the Japanese then? Uh, you know, there's a thing about Japanese culture, you know, that overall, you know, there's a, there's a thing in Japanese culture of being very kind of hardcore being kind of stiff upper lip, you know, and I admire the Japanese for that. I've learned a lot from that, you know, like people here, when sh when things get really bad, the Japanese tend not to say anything. They tend to do something. They react instead of like talking, you know, and people were freaked out. You know, I was on the train trying to get home at one the morning after, you know, I could see the look on everybody's faces. We all shared the same feeling that this is bad, you know, but no one said anything. They just kind of looked at each other, and we just, we just cooperated. You know, it's an amazing thing about Japanese culture that instead of freaking out and looting and being insane, people just knew that this is bad, and you don't need to talk about how bad it is because we all know people just cooperated, and they behaved in a very orderly manner, you know. So, so I mean, basically, it's, it's, it's obviously a really great quality that you describe, but... but yeah. In the terms of nuclear, if we were going to jump onto that subject, uh, basically mm. we could turn around and say that, you know, it's been a great hindrance when you have a, a sort of large uh, sort of um, uh, industrial accident like uh, Fukushima happened. Um, oh, it's in, terrible. In terms of people's uh, ability to confront the issue. It was very difficult. I mean, here in Tokyo, we didn't know what to do. All we knew right. to do was to get information. And for the first month, everybody just watched in Tokyo. Everybody kind of played it cool, you know. Everybody just kind of got information, tried to figure out what was going on, deal with the shortage. We had, we had supply storages too in Tokyo. We had, and we're, lots of things we were doing with us. We just kind of observed and just watched what was going on. And, and in terms quickly, of the mainstream media in Japan uh, and around the world, you know, after about two to three weeks, they started censoring uh, any information well, about Fukushima. So. Censoring, censoring in Tokyo, there's a good censoring in Japan, right? Didn't happen after two or three weeks. The censoring didn't really go on until Shinzo Abe was elected to power. Right. You know, there's a misconception that the censoring went on immediately. No, it didn't. You know, because a lot, of, you know, a lot of people, you know, not to say anything bad, but you don't live in Japan. You know, you weren't getting the information that we were getting. Sure. You know, and at first we were getting the media was all over it, like stink on shit. Not this use disparaging language, but it was kind of like that, you know. You had the uh, Asahi. Asahi Shinbom is kind of like the mainstream left-wing paper here. You know, Japan Times is the foreign gaijin paper, you know. You know, and they were all over it. The media here was mad about it. They were just, like, angry. They were forcing the government and TEPCO to give information. And really hard-pressed them, right? And a lot of information came out with the first three or four months. That's right. It was like full blown. The media here was very impressive. Yeah. But after I, about I, a year, and a, but after about a year and a half, you know, we had this like far right wing fascist government come into power, and that changed a lot of things. And the reason that happened was because the Social Democrat Party, the Democratic Party of Japan, who was in power and all this went down, kind of dropped the ball on it. Right? They weren't organized enough. They weren't ready enough for this, and they got kicked out. And when Shinzo Abe came to power, that's when the censorship. That's when shutting down everybody. That's when the intimidation happened. That's when the violence court protesters happened. That's when all that started. So make no mistake that the censorship was not immediate. It, it wasn't until the fascists here in Japan got in power that all that started to happen. True. I mean, I have to say, I was in the UK, and the censorship started after three weeks in the UK. Um, I heard about that. I heard a lot of Brits here in Japan were pretty adverse to hearing what the Japanese media was saying sure. compared to what the British media was saying. It was totally different. Yeah. yeah, no, was, uh, and there was uh, it, there was a, a local TV station that basically uh, uh, called uh, I can't remember the name of it at the moment, uh, but basically uh, did a, a study uh, with uh, Mikanoro, who was uh, working in Chernobyl, 
Uh, Mika Noro, yeah, yeah, that guy's an amazing person. Yeah, and uh, she, she basically went on and she did a, a study, an epidemiological study, and she was finding nosebleeds, uh, various uh, uh, stomach problems and uh, headaches and uh, rashes and various other things that had come up mm. uh, about three, three months after the uh, disaster. I did a lot of reports on that stuff in the first couple of years. Mm. You know, and people often ask me, why don't I don't keep doing those reports? And the reason why is, like, there's nothing more to say. Sure, sure. You know, it I is mean, what it is. I've made those reports. I've filed those reports and videos yeah. and writings across the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, what more can I say about it? The facts are there. Well, there is one thing I could, could get you to say, possibly, or talk about, is the fact sure. that... Uh, no, what I was going to say was, uh, was that the UNSCARE uh, did a report uh, about a year or which, so ago which, saying... Back up again. What is that? Which publication? Uh, the UNSCARE. Uh, U-N-S-C-E-A-R. The UN uh, radiation uh, sort of uh, safety. Oh, those clowns. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> but it, it, in that group, there are some half-decent people that were trying to fight against the pro-nukes because uh, it's a kind of a mixed bag. But what they did, they had to agree on was that over 50% of Japanese food would be contaminated to some degree. So that might be very small amounts in their eyes. Um, and so therefore they would set the 100 becquerel standard because people were eating more of little bits of cesium. So they worked it out with, a, with a, an equation. Um, with that in mind, you know, how, how did you deal with the uh, food situation, trying to find clean, what, what you might presume to be uh, clean food in Japan you know, in uh, 2011 and, and since, in fact? Well, that was a big thing I used to talk about a lot, too. Yeah. You know, in the first couple of years. You know, if you look back on some of the reports I did, I used to focus on that a lot, you know. And how I dealt with it personally, like, here in Japan, you know, people talk about the privilege to leave. Everybody talks about, well, why don't you just leave? You know, and these people, they must be Westerners, right? And they have the privilege to choose where they live, you know. But here in Japan, you know, we don't have no choice. This is our country. It's a home, you know. This is my adopted home, you know. It's not like I can pack up and leave. And I was really offended by all these people who said, just leave, just get out of there. I'm like, you know, buy me a plane ticket. You know, it's my home. It's where I live. I lived here for a long time. You know, I, I'm financially connected here. I just can't pack up and leave, you know. That just made me angry a lot of times. It frustrated me that people would say that to me, you know. But, you know, but what, how we dealt with it, right? We looked at the areas that were most contaminated, right? You got like Fukushima, you got Ibaraki. Those are the two most danger zones. And unfortunately, that's where the uh, large majority of rice in Japan is grown. Ibaraki and, and Fukushima, in that area. So when you go to the grocery store looking for rice, what we do, we go by harvest seasons, right? Now in Japan, when you go for rice, it's the previous harvest that comes out to market. Not the current harvest, right? So in Japan still, they put the area where the rice was produced at. Right? They have to. It's kind of a regulation. So I go looking for rice. I go look for the areas that are further away from the most contaminated zones. And that's where I buy my rice from. You know, as far as other foods, if it says Ibaraki or Fukushima, no way. Not eating it. I'm just, you know, those are two prefectures that are kind of like you don't eat from. Everything else, you just try to find furthest away from those prefectures that you can. And you do the best you can. If you got the money... You can afford it. You buy bottled water. You avoid Tokyo water because Tokyo water was proved to be contaminated with nuclear radiation within the first two days. And the government stopped talking about that pretty quick. You know, So that's how we deal with it, basically. We look for the areas where we buy food to, that are furthest away from con contaminated zones. Sure. You know? there's, there's a question I have to ask you as well. It's a sort of medical one. Uh, mm. as, you, as you were saying, when uh, President Abe came to power, he basically said that, you know, he, he enacted various things. And there's one uh, article which mentioned the fact that, uh, that he wasn't going to allow genetic uh, blood tests on uh, victims living in Fukushima and Miyagi and wherever um, because, um, uh, because it, there was a blood test that they could do to see if there was any radiation damage to, to the blood. But it had to be done within three years. And then mm. on the two and a half year mark, as the university in Japan was asking for these blood tests to be done, uh, Abe refused it on, on the count that um, basically that uh, it, it might find illegitimate children. 
now is this some sort of, <laughs> is this some sort of quirk I'm of japanese sorry. culture I'm sorry dude that's funny yeah oh my god really yeah. that's hilarious I'm sorry I, that cracks me up yeah so <laughs> that, that was that was what he said and then of course that was oh it my it god. just <laughs> it was just squashed right crazy stuff yeah of course that's ridiculous yeah who the fuck i'm sorry to use foul language again but <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> oh wow that's, that's so abe yeah that's yeah. so shinzo abe that is oh yeah. wow <laughs> that's so right wing japan all right oh. what, why, why is his wife uh, i mean also there was a load of uh, japanese activists and they're largely women uh, who decided that they were going to stop giving their husband sex uh, if they... Okay, no, no, that's a recent thing. That's nothing to do with Fukushima. Okay, and, and do you think that um, Abe's wife, who's anti-nuclear, <laughs> is doing it as well? Huh? Abe, you know Abe's wife is anti-nuclear? Yeah, strong anti-nuclear. Do you want me to talk about the whole thing about women denying sex in Japan? Yeah, go for it. I, uh, I'm very I can, but it's not related to nuclear. It's related to the last majorial um, election in Tokyo. The mayor, the current mayor of Tokyo, when he was running for election, right? That's a Mazui guy. Now, I'm not pronouncing him completely correct, but <coughs> he said that women could not effectively serve in politics because they have a period. Right? Wow. He said because they have a period, they become emotionally unstable. That's not good for politics. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, only in Japan <laughs> could someone say that shit and get away from, get elected, right? Yeah. But when he said that. There's this huge movement in the metro area here in Tokyo for women to refuse any sex to a man they were involved in, but openly said they were going to vote for him. That's where that comes from. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it, I spend, oh, Japanese politics. You, you, oh. well, <laughs> there, there was, the there was a, here, the there was an earlier campaign by uh, anti-nuclear women. Uh, to do that, I don't know if it was very big, but maybe that was uh, maybe that's what triggered this particular uh, campaign that, uh, of uh, women. That probably got the got the idea started. It's more of a Spartan thing, you know. Yeah. The old, the old classic Spartan thing, you know, like until you finish war, we're not going to give you any loving. You know, it's just, uh, I thought that was very ingenious, you know, because the way the the, um, the substructures in Japan are, are formulated, sure, that can have a very powerful effect if it's done the right way. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the the big movement from that came from that election of the the Japanese the the Tokyo mayor. Right. That's where all that media hype came from. Brilliant. And that's why I wasn't out. Yeah. I'm uh, glad you bring it up because a lot of people don't even know that happened. There was, okay. There was a Spartan movement. There was a Spartan movement that that went on. You know. So I'm glad you bring it up. Yeah. No. Good one. Good one. That was a good story to to get to. Us, so. Um, oh yeah. I suppose, I suppose looking at it, you know, obviously I introduced you as a Marxist American, a kind of a rare breed indeed. Um, and I, talking about women uh, and women's equality and rights and uh, what have you, um, how, how does Japan shape up? And I, you did do one story on the lady with the vagina boat and you did another story. The vagina, I, vagina, the vagina art, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and is she in prison still? What's the deal there? It's a very interesting case going on. I know I did like a, I think I did at least three videos on her case. That's right. And now it's in the courts. Basically, the first time she was arrested. For those who don't know about this, and maybe I get some background on this, right? What she actually did was crossing a vague line of pornography and obscenity in Japan, right? There's a very vague line between art and trash in Japan, and the law is very vague on it, right? What she did was um. She started, she took a, um, a mold of her vagina and used it to make art, right? Which in most cases, Japan wouldn't care so much. But she pushed it. She took it to a step further. She made a canoe out of the shape of her own vagina. And then took a ride net canoe down one of the central rivers in Tokyo. Not once, but twice, right? Now, that wasn't enough either. That wasn't enough to get arrested either, right? That wasn't enough. Then she, with a um, erotic store, we have erotic shops in Japan, which are not porn. Erotic shops in Japan are where we deal with the eureka of life and human society. It's art, it's um, kink, it's um, expressions of sexuality, but it's not a porn shop. It's hard. Either you know what it's like or you don't. You've been here, you've been in one of those shops, or you don't. It's hard to explain. So her uh, partner in crime started selling some of her uh, erotic art 
using with the molds of her vagina. Like we're talking like a river. She used, like like your little like um, sculptures of of a river, using her vagina, things like that. And the thing that got her arrested was um, she distributed the blueprint for the kayak, right, on the internet, so other people can make the same kayak and kayak and the motor her vagina. So she got arrested about the first time. And the cops basically told her, like, don't do this again. The whole finger wag, I think, goes to Japan. I've been arrested in Japan before. And usually the first time you get arrested, they usually like, kind of stop you on the hand and say, don't do this again, God damn it. Hmm. And it's let her go, right? But she said, no, screw you guys. You know, I don't like the way you treat me. You know, you, you, you patriarchal bastards. So she did it again. She, she did another ride down the Central River in Tokyo in her kayak, you know. And he continues selling her erotic art, you know. And they arrest her again. The second time, they charged her with obscenity crimes. Violating the, the Japanese uh, pornography law, which says you cannot display open um, genitalia uh, in, in a uh, erotic manner. Right? So they kept her in jail that time about two or three weeks. She said, screw you cops, I'm going to answer none of your questions. I've been interrogated by the police. I know what it's like. It's very intense, and it can be very intimidating. And she very stood up to him, and she got released a second time. You know, but part of because of the media attention, that's why I let her go, because usually it's unheard of to get bail in Japan. Okay. It's unheard of. Japanese or gaijin, it's unheard of to get bail in Japan. If you get, if the cops snatch you up, typically you're in jail into your trial, into the duration of your trial. But due to the media attention, she got released Excellent. on a very small bail fine, you know, and now it's in the courts and it's up to the lawyers because the system in Japan is different from what you may be used to. The trial, in, a trial in Japan is a show trial. It, it is meaningless. It's everything that happens before the trial in Japan that's important. You're a Bengoshi or your lawyer, right? What he does is he tries to negotiate the terms and conditions of the trial before the trial happens. So his best chance is to try to get the case dismissed. He tries to discredit, discredit evidence before it's presented to the judge. They have a negotiation that goes on between the judge, the prosecution, and the, and the defense before it goes to trial, right? And they decide what's going to be permissible and what's not. So right now, that system, that process is going on right now. So that's where it is right now with her, right? So, I mean, that with the background to the fact that uh, we're talking, uh, we had you met Yumino Nito uh, with a discussion on the FCCJ channel, the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I have a bit of contact with them, but I'm not really close to them, but yeah. Sure. But, but they, they did a, an interview with her, uh, or a, she did a statement uh, about helping high school girls escape Tokyo's sex industry, you know. Yes, yes, it's a big thing. I could tell you some, some tales about that. That's insane. Well, I mean, that, that might be useful because it, it, as we're on that topic now, if you could, just a, a brief outline. Okay. That whole situation, we call it the, um, the Jose business, right? High school, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> it's summer in Tokyo, you know, you get congested. Um, the Jose business, right, that whole thing is a, will be very shocking to many Westerners, right? It's a huge industry. It's a thing where women are objectified to a point to where the younger you are, the higher your value in the market you are, right? That sounds very sick, right, but it's very true. Like, you take a 15-year-old um, girl in Japan, she can make a lot of money in Tokyo, right? There's different businesses that offer this stuff, right? Now, I mean, typically, no actually penetrative sex is involved. It usually involves, like, um, laying down with the girl, talking to the girl, watching the girl do everyday mundane things, like read a manga or um, polish her nails. And if you pay extra money, you can do things like touch her leg or touch her arm or things like that. There's also the old uh, panty business in Japan, right? A lot of young girls will um, soil their panties through erotic means, and they'll um, sell it to a distributor. And the distributor will um, sell those panties to um, clients who want that. And those clients use that. They sniff it, they smell it, and they use it for their erotic pleasure. Uh, yeah, the Jose business is a big problem in Japan. Yeah. And also, nice. full-on sex does happen. That's a more uh, hardcore element of the business. It's usually carried out by the Yakuza, which you guys may know as mafia, organized crime. The more hardcore, like, paid-out sex to a 16, 15-year-old girl. 
that you cared about your act. So yeah, that goes on here, you know, and just like maybe a year and a half ago, finally, possession of underage erotic pornography was made legal. Think about that, just a year and a half ago. Wow. So that that's that, I can comment on that's what I say about that. Yeah. Really yeah. On that shit. Sure. It's, it's a big topic, um, but uh, it, it was well br briefed over. Thanks for that info, though. You know, it's, it's uh, good to get some background on, on these stories. Um, I'd like to sort of bring us to Okinawa now, just briefly, to maybe to finish off. Um, and uh, two Okinawan major newspapers were uh, threatened with censure, um, and we're sort of looking at the protests in Okinawa against the U.S. Uh, bases. And of course, those newspapers supporting those uh, those protesters and the mayor that got elected as well. Um, yeah. So, could you give us a little bit of uh, a synopsis on what's going on there with that at all, uh, Joe? Well, first of all, like the overwhelming majority of Okinawa people don't want the U.S. military there. They get the economic harm that would come from kicking the military out because they benefit a lot from uh, economically from having the U.S. military there. You know, tourism food, all that, you know. But for them, it's more than that, because you're dealing with a group of people, ethnically, ethnically unique people called the Ryukyu people. They're not Japanese, and they're not Chinese. They're kind of a mix, culturally and ethically, of Japanese and Chinese, all right? And for a long time, Ryukyu was not even a part of Japan. It was an independent nation, what they call a pirate nation, all right? And eventually they got taken over by the Japanese. A long history of that between the Chinese and the Japanese. I won't go into it now, but uh, these days what they want, they want the U.S. military out. They don't like it. The noise, you know, the rapes of young women that go on in Okinawa, all that stuff. They're just sick of it, you know. They want to be more independent. They want more autonomy from Tokyo. Uh, you know, it, they just don't want them there. They just want them out. They want the U.S. military gone. Uh, you know, that's all I can say about it. You know, they're, they're sick of it. They're sick of the abuse, they're sick of the harassment, they're sick of the being ignored by Tokyo, they're sick of the rape of the women, they're sick of the whole damn situation. They just want people to, they just want the Americans to get out there, because the Americans are not doing overall nothing good for them, you know? Cool. All right, well, uh, Jimmy, o over to you, mate. If, is, it, is there uh, anything you'd like to add to this at all? Well, y yeah, I suppose... Um, well, there's lots of things I'd like to add, but I, I suppose we've got limited time. But, John, you were speaking uh, a little bit earlier about rice and food and how you'll source your rice from parts of Japan which have not been so badly affected by uh, nuclear radiation. And, and you were also saying, like, how people in Japan, you know, it's your home, and, uh, it, and quite understandably so, uh, people are not so inclined to move away. But... But considering the fact that like radioactivity is cumulative and it's it's into the water supply and everything, would the right thing not be to do to get the kids out of there at least and uh, give them a little bit of chance to 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 grow older and uh, so that um, because we know radioactivity doesn't affect the adults as so badly as it affects the children. So what what would you be your thoughts on on, on those couple of points? And okay, and oh, also, uh, sorry, and also bear in mind that like the, uh, how long can you sort of like source rice which is before, which has been grown before the, the nuclear accident? That uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay, well, on that, that last point, right? What we had was a three-year um, backstock in Japan, right, of non-radiated rice, right? So we knew that we had a three-year backstock in Japan. So what a lot of people did was mass buy rice. I did it myself. I bought like tons of rice. In my apartment, I had rice up to the ceiling, you know. So we did that a lot too. That happened in the early days, the, the first two years, you know. But when you talk about the children, right, there's been a big movement among mothers in Japan to ask questions to the government, you know. There's a big thing. I did have a video on it uh, so a couple of years ago about this uh, lawyer. She was a woman. She had a child. And she told her child to refuse to drink milk. And I think it was Ibaraki, you know, from a high school. Like, you know, mama said don't drink the milk. And here's what happened, right? Just to show you how disgusting, because I'm, I'm a teacher myself, and I'm disgusted by what happened, right? This teacher pulled this kid out of class, made him hold that milk in his hand. And he said to him, if you think you're not Japanese enough to drink Japanese milk, and you're too good to drink this milk, 
I want you to pour that milk in this bucket in front of all your friends and show how much you hate Japan and how much you won't drink this milk, this good Japanese milk. And the child broke down in tears and still refused to do it because Mama said don't drink that damn milk. That's a situation with children have to deal with in this country where their mothers are telling them common sense. But yet, you know, we have the institutions of Japan. These superstructures and substructures support the economic base, telling these kids to go against the will of their own mothers. You know, that's what children are facing in this country. Yeah. Well, they're well, facing the options. You know, they're facing the options. These children are listening to their mothers who are wise and, only, and really love their children and want to take care of their children. But they go to these institutions who are forcing these children to go against common logical sense due to political convenience, you know. So talk about what the children are facing, that's what they're facing here, you know. Yeah, there's, we, we certainly have covered uh, uh, on the blogs, you know, children de uh, de uh, was it, um, cleaning up the uh, swimming pools in their schools, you know, and they've been given steam clean. Yeah, that goes on too, that goes on too, you know. And, uh, kids, hey, just clean the pool and we'll swim in it. You know? And don't get us started on thyroid cancers in children either, huh? Oh, the thyroid cancer thing. I've done a lot of research on that, man. It's just getting wild in, like, Fukushima and Ibaraki. Yeah. It's kind of out of control there for kids doing, showing uh, um, thyroid growths. It's like so many kids are showing up with thyroid growths, right? And the doctors, he's paid off, like, sold out doctors telling the kids, no, 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 it's fine, don't worry about it, tell your mom has no problem. It's a normal thing for a kid to have. No, it's not. It's not normal, medically, for a child to have a growth on, a, on their thyroid, you know? Yeah. That's a problem, you know? But we'll be coming back to that story. And I think this is a good point to, to leave the interview. And um, I hope you're going to come back to us, uh, John, uh, for more reports. Yeah. Anytime, you know, I'm more than happy to talk to you guys. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And I uh, really am gracious that you guys invited me to your show. Um, cool. Thank you so much. That's no problem, my friend. <laughs> Business, business.